The Department of Justice is suing Apple, and in my opinion, it's about time. In today's press conference, Merrick Garland outlines the violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So let's get it started and I'll pop in throughout. Uh, good morning. Earlier today, the Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, sued Apple in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey for violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Over the last two decades, Apple has become one of the most valuable public companies in the world. Today, its net income exceeds the individual gross domestic product of more than 100 countries. That is in large part due to the success of the iPhone, Apple's signature smartphone product. For over a decade, iPhone sales have made up a majority of Apple's annual revenue. Today, Apple's share of the U.S. performance smartphone market exceeds 70%, and its share of the entire U.S. smartphone market exceeds 65%. Apple charges as much as nearly $1,600 for an iPhone. But as our complaint alleges, Apple has maintained Crazy. monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits. First of all, can you imagine paying $1,600 for a phone? It's just insane just to think about that kind of money going towards a phone that hasn't really had any enhancements at all for the last 10 generations. But by violating federal antitrust law, consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. For developers, that has meant being forced to play by rules that insulate Apple from competition. And as outlined in our complaint, we allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Now that might seem confusing, but we know for a fact that they degrade anything coming from Droid, but he gets into that in a little bit. Apple carries out its exclusionary anti-competitive conduct in two principal ways. First, Apple imposes contractual restrictions and fees that limit the features and functionality that developer can offer iPhone users. Second, Apple selectively restricts access to the points of connection between third-party apps and the iPhone's operating system, degrading the functionality of non-Apple apps and accessories. As a result, for most of the past 15 years, Apple has collected a tax in the form of a 30% commission on the price of any app downloaded from the App Store, as well as on in-app purchases. Apple is able to command these fees from companies of all sizes. Apple has also suppressed the emergence of programs like cloud streaming apps, including gaming apps, as well as super apps that could reduce user dependence on Apple's own operating system and expensive hardware. And as any iPhone user who has ever seen a green text message or received a tiny grainy video can attest, Apple's anti-competitive conduct also includes making it more difficult for iPhone users to message with users of non-Apple products. It does this by diminishing the functionality of its own messaging app and by diminishing the functionality of third-party messaging apps. By doing so, Apple knowingly and deliberately degrades quality, privacy, and security for its users. For example, if an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user in Apple Messages, the text appears not only as a green bubble, but incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted, videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. As a result, iPhone users perceive rival smartphones as being lower quality because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse. So I can attest to that because every iPhone user, I use a Droid phone, first of all. Every iPhone user says, oh, Droid sucks. And I've got a Samsung Galaxy 23, I think it is. 
the thing is awesome. And I can use it like a hard drive. And everyone who's got the iCloud is like, oh yeah, it's perfect. No, like the getting things off your iPhone is, is so difficult. The other thing about the messaging, I've got a really powerful Apple computer for my recording studio. And it took me so many times to just turn off the messaging app that's in that computer. It took me like three different tries to get it to stop because it tried to connect itself to the iPad I use in the studio, the computer, and then anyone who had the contact information for the business was like texting and I'm like, guys, I'm not even seeing these messages. It was really hard to turn off. And I remember my girlfriend at one point tried to get stuff off the iCloud and it was like ridiculously hard. So I was like, oh, we'll just plug it in and we'll just download it off your phone. It was like next to impossible. And Apple does this on purpose, but I'm glad to see that Merrick Garland is going after Apple because this is nefarious activity. Even though Apple is the one responsible for breaking cross-platform messaging, and it does so intentionally. For example, in 2013, a senior executive at Apple explained that supporting cross-platform messaging in Apple messages, quote, would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones, close quote. In 2022, Apple's CEO was asked whether Apple would fix iPhone to Android messaging. The questionnaire added, quote, not to make it personal, but I can't send my mom certain videos, close quote. Apple's CEO responded, buy your mom an iPhone. Classic, right? Totally classic. In addition to selectively controlling app distribution and creation, we allege that Apple is violating the law by conditionally restricting developers' access to the interface, which is needed to make an app functional on the Apple operating system. For a product like a smartwatch or a digital wallet to be useful to an iPhone user, it must be able to communicate with the iPhone's operating system. But Apple creates barriers that make it extremely difficult and expensive for both users and developers to venture outside the Apple ecosystem. When it comes to smartwatches, Apple not only drives users to purchase an Apple Watch, which is only compatible with an iPhone, it also uses its technical and contractual controls to make it harder for someone with an iPhone to use a non-Apple smartwatch. And when it comes to digital wallets, Apple's exclusionary conduct goes a step further. Digital wallets allow users to store and use passes and credentials in a single app, including credit cards, personal identification, movie tickets, and car keys. Apple Wallet is Apple's proprietary digital wallet on the iPhone. Apple actively encourages banks, merchants, and other parties to participate in Apple Wallet, but it simultaneously exerts its monopoly power to block these same partners from developing alternative payment products and services for iPhone users. For example, Apple has blocked third-party developers from creating competing digital wallets on the iPhone that use what is known as tap-to-pay functionality. That is the function that makes a digital wallet, well, a wallet. Instead, Apple forces those who want to use the wallet function to share personal information with Apple, even if they would prefer to share that information solely with their bank, medical provider, or other trusted third party. So it is a monopoly. And what Apple has tried to do with Apple users is convince them that giving Apple full control of everything in your life is the only option. And they basically make their technology such that it's almost impossible to integrate anything that isn't Apple. And that's why this is happening because it's 100% true that Apple tries to block all other technologies and make you so dependent upon their network that leaving it is next to impossible, they've got all your information, and then trying to just integrate anything that's useful, that's not an Apple product, that might be cheaper or better, makes it impossible to integrate with Apple. So I'm so happy this is happening because it's about time. When an iPhone user puts a credit or debit card in Apple Wallet, Apple inserts itself into the process that would otherwise occur directly between the user and the card issuer. This introduces an additional potential point of failure for the privacy and security of Apple users. And that is just one way in which Apple is willing to make the iPhone less secure and less private 
in order to maintain its monopoly power. The Supreme Court defines monopoly power as, quote, the power to control prices or exclude competition. As set out in our complaint, Apple has that power in the smartphone market. Now, having monopoly power does not itself violate the antitrust laws, but it does when a firm acquires or maintains monopoly power, not because it has a superior product or superior business acumen, but by engaging in exclusionary conduct. As set out in our complaint, Apple has maintained its power, not because of its superiority, because of its unlawful exclusionary behavior. Mm -hmm. Monopolies like Apple's threaten the free and fair markets upon which our economy is based. They stifle innovation, they hurt producers and workers, and they increase costs for consumers. Yeah. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. But there's a law for that. The Justice Department will vigorously enforce antitrust law. Enforcing the law protects consumers from higher prices and fewer choices. That is the Justice Department's legal obligation. That is what the American people expect. That is what they deserve. I am grateful to the attorneys and staff of the department's antitrust division for their tireless work on this case on behalf of the American people. I'll now turn the podium over to the deputy attorney general. All right, Merrick. So 100% true. And iPhone users and Apple users, will always, they'll always tell you, oh, it's so much better. Oh, I can't communicate with you because oh, you're a droid user. Oh, your stuff stinks, right? No, it doesn't. Apple's actually degrading what you get from droid users on purpose to make the product look worse so you're like in fear of oh man if i go with that bad phone i'm never gonna get it no the samsung camera is actually better than the iphone camera and people have done side by side tests multiple times it's not even about whose product is better it's about the fact that apple has continued to try to create this network that is impervious to any competition and then make the user submit and i mean the word submit to their power over everything in their technical life, including the astronomical and out of control pricing of these products. And we all know that Apple practices designed obsolescence whenever possible, but furthermore, they got caught actually degrading the processing power of phones that of iPhone users' phones through a bug that they submitted to all these phones to make people want to upgrade because their old phone was so slow when it was literally inserted into the phone to degrade its performance and they got caught. So Apple, in my opinion, is extremely nefarious. I had to get an Apple computer for the recording studio because literally everybody was like, oh, you have to use Apple, you have to use Apple. I'm a PC guy. It's way easier, it's way faster, it costs like 20% as much money and it's not, not buggy and the file sharing and the file saving process is way easier. Apple basically wants you to be numb to thinking when you're using their products. And I hate that about Apple. It's like, I wanna be able to see where all the connectivity is in the file structure. I don't want you to just tell me, oh, here it is, with no reason, no pathway. It's somewhat there in some capacities, but in many cases, they're just like, click this pretty button. I just want you to click the pretty button. I don't want you to know how the pretty button works. I don't know, want you to know how it actually connects with the rest of your CPU. They don't want you to think for yourself. They don't want you to understand how the computer works at all. They want people to just blindly click pretty buttons and it'll just give you what you need to do next. They don't want you to understand what you're doing. They just want you to click the pretty buttons. So from a PC person using an Apple computer, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like they won't let me actually figure out the structure. They're just gonna have things pop up that they think I need next. And there's a lot of automated processes that keep the user dumb in my opinion and make actually the user much more dependent upon Apple products because that's all they know how to use, all the pretty buttons. They don't understand the structure of the computer at all. It's, it's crazy to me. So anyways, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. I do other commentary videos like this, so thanks for watching and I can't wait to see Apple go down big time.